Amen. In the second chapter of Luke's Gospel, it says at verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. This is the gift of God. This is the, the desire of nations. This is the great promise of old which has been delivered in, in, in this amazing moment with the proclamation of angels and great glory given to God. This is the answer. You know, it's become kind of trite to say Jesus is the answer, but this is the answer. This is the answer. This is the answer to all of, of our longings, all of our needs, all of our great uh, lack is answered in this one Jesus Christ. And the whole thing is easily summed up in the single verse from John chapter 3 where it says at verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This, this is the great plan, this is the great promise, this is the great purpose of Christmas. Now, we have come to describe Christmas in a great many ways here in the United States of America in the 21st century. And for many people, Christmas is about candles and evergreens and snowmen and reindeer and almost anything but Jesus Christ. And sometimes uh, in, in the midst of all of that, it's, it's easy to kind of lose track of what in fact is the spirit of Christmas and to be swallowed up because there is, it's not just consumerism and materialism, but there's just so many different pulls and so much cultural baggage and so much, you know, most of us have been here in this country our entire lives and Christmas has been a part of our lives before Jesus and after Jesus and there's just a lot of baggage that gets mixed up together and it isn't always easy for us to, to sort through what is Christmas really about. Is it about cold weather? Is it about red noses? Is it about hot chocolate? Is it about singing outdoors? What is Christmas about? And the answer very simply is it's celebrating the gift which God has given. It's celebrating the fulfillment of the promise. It's celebrating the prophecy fulfilled and the great Savior coming. And there's a lot of interesting, exciting, and even good things that we might choose to celebrate, but there is nothing more interesting, exciting, or good than our salvation, than our deliverance from our sin, than our restoration of, or the, uh, the reconciliation of our relationship with God so that we can come to the Father who made us and be His children. 
with His Spirit shed abroad in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is an amazing thing. And some of you don't remember very well what it was like to live without Him. Some of you remember all too well what it was like to live without Him. But I remember, I have vivid memories of what it's like to be a, a separated, an alien, apart from the covenants of God, without hope in this world. I know exactly what that feels like. Anybody besides me remember? I know exactly what that feels like. I, I remember with tremendous vividness the hopelessness and the despair, the guilt and the shame, and then the, 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 the crazy rationalizations and justifications to try to get rid of the guilt and shame because I didn't think I should be guilty and shamed. I just knew I was. Didn't seem to me that I was any worse than anybody else on a scale of whatever, grading on the curve. I should be making the cut, and yet somehow I knew in my nowhere where I wasn't. Has anybody besides me been to that point? Yes. Where you just kind of know that something here isn't cutting it. There's still guilt and shame involved. Yes. I'm not what I consider to be a bad person, and yet I've got guilt and shame in my life. I sense myself coming short of a standard, and yet in my own mind I can't imagine that the standard is really that high, that I can't make it. Hello? And then there's that, that laser-like moment of clarity where suddenly I see that it's my sin which has separated me from God, and while I may not be the biggest sinner I know, I'm a big enough sinner to be separated from God. And while I may be able to justify that the things that I've done don't seem that bad in the sense of the society in which I live, they're bad enough to separate me from God. And in that moment of clarity, I see the Savior being offered to me as the answer. That it isn't a matter of me trying to live up to a standard, but it's a matter of Him bearing that penalty, my guilt, my shame, my price, my sin on the cross so that I can walk free from that, and not just free from that, but walk as God's very righteousness in Christ Jesus. That's a wonderful privilege. And that, in fact, is the spirit of Christmas. That is what Christmas is about. Now, here in John's Gospel, chapter 1, I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of John. In chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And while I'm sure that it's entirely appropriate to say that the darkness comprehended it not, it's also appropriate uh, and a perfectly appropriate translation of this word in the Greek that the darkness overcame it not. The darkness couldn't, it not only could not darkness grasp what was happening, but darkness couldn't overcome or resist what was happening. Darkness had no ability to take hold of and grasp, which is this concept of comprehend. We take hold of and grasp something. What was happening? This light was from God and there was no controlling it by any physical means, by any physics law by any uh, natural means. Are you understanding this? This was God the Father taking action in His creation. And there wasn't any force already here or any power already in existence that could resist this. If this birth could have been stopped, it would have been stopped. I'll say that again. If this birth could have been stopped, it would have been stopped. You say, well, well maybe... Maybe the forces of darkness didn't know. Hello, angels came and declared it. I'm not talking about the angels who came to the shepherds and said it's done. I'm talking about before we ever got rolling. Angels came to Zechariah. Angels came to Mary. Angels came to Joseph. This was all along the line. These angels' appearances were not going unnoticed. If this birth could have been stopped, it would have been stopped. But this was the action of the Father. He took action, and nothing was going to prevent this from coming to pass. That's the great love wherewith He's loved us. That's the great love wherewith He's loved us. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son over every possible objection and resistance. He gave His only begotten Son. Is that an amen moment? 
At verse 10 it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The declaration of verse 12 is, but as many as received Him, that's a kind of a whosoever, as many as received Him, however many that would be, one, two, five, twenty, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, a billion, whatever the number is, as many as received Him. As many as. I like as many as. Is. I like whosoever's. I can qualify for them. Amen? You know, if, if, if we go to talking about who's the strongest, well, maybe, maybe not. I might not make the cut on that. You start talking about who's the brightest? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on where the cut is. You talk about who's the best looking? <laughs> I'm a little more secure over there, but... Uh, <laughs> just teasing. But, you know, if it was up to us to produce something that made us acceptable, then tough to say whether you're making the cut or not. Are you bright enough? Are you strong enough? Are you good enough? Are you pretty enough? But if it's a whosoever moment, you can qualify. Just decide to qualify. Whosoever you can do. Bright and strong may be a little tricky, but whosoever you can do. Hello? Whosoever you can do. As many as received him, to as many as received him, to them gave he power. Now the marginal reference in this Bible says the right or privilege is another translation of power. In many modern English translations the word is rendered authority because it's not talking about power in the sense of raw energy or strength. It's talking about power in the sense of the authority or authorization, the right or the privilege to do something. I carry a driver's license, which gives me the power to drive legally on the roads around here. It's not that it gives me physical energy to do it. It gives me an authorization to do it. I am empowered to do this thing, right? And that's the kind of power we're talking about. We're not talking about a lightning bolt from heaven coming to you, but we're talking about an authorization. As many as received him, to them he gave an authorization an authority, a privilege, a right to do something, to become the sons of God, or more literally, the offspring of God. The word we're translating sons here in the Greek is the word techno, which is talking about offsprings. It's actually, in, in, in talking about it with its synonyms, it's describing offsprings in, in the... Uh, offsprings, offsprung. <laughs> it's describing offsprings in the most... Um, the most direct sense. It means literally one produced from another. It's describing that relationship that says it doesn't, we're talking about what we would call today a biological relationship where you may or may not live with those people, you may or may not even know those people, but that is where you come from and where you were produced. That's what this word is describing. It's describing children in the, that most basic sense we become the offspring of God, produced by His Spirit, born again into the earth by the Spirit of God, not of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but by the Spirit of God. We're God's children is what we become. That's a great thing. He gives us the authority, the authorization to become the children of God which is an answer to the heart's cry of every person that's ever been born. Because regardless of what people believe or say, every person who's ever been born has a desire in the very core of their being to be connected to the God who made them. 
And something in us understands that we're supposed to be children of God. And something in us knows that we're falling short of that on our own, and we're not. And no matter how many times we tell each other that there's this great brotherhood of man and that we're all children of God, something in us knows that that isn't quite answering this need and desire I've got. And that no matter how often we say there is no God, we know somewhere in us that God made us and we want to be connected to Him. We understand that we have this calling to be His children. And this answers that calling. As many as receive Jesus Christ, to them He gives the authority to become the children of God, even to them that believe on His name. And then he goes on to tell us what believing on his name produces in us, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We're speaking of that new birth. Is that an amen moment? Now, if you'll come with me to the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, I want to spend a moment looking at the, the mechanism by which this happens. How it's described to us here. Now, the 10th chapter of the book of Romans covers a lot of territory, and uh, it, it, it be, I'm going to begin reading at uh, verse 9 where it says, that if, but the that he's referring to is the, the statement in verse 8 where he says, the word is nigh thee, even in your mouth, even in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. That, so this is the word of faith which we preach. Now, we're not going to take the time to study through these first seven verses of the chapter, but essentially what he says is, uh, my heart's desire for my own people is that they would be saved. I testify, they're very religious, and they've got a lot of zeal for their religion, but they don't, it's in ignorance. They don't have the knowledge. They don't understand what they ought to be understanding out of their religion. And because they're ignorant of that, because they're ignorant of God's righteousness, they work hard to try to establish their own righteousness, not submitting themselves to God's righteousness. But Jesus Christ is the answer to the question of righteousness from the law. And then he goes on to make these declarations concerning Jesus, leading up to the point where he says, this is the word of faith which we preach. And then he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, this is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now verse 9 is a very simple statement, and it is the crux of the issue. But the next three verses explain that verse to us. When he says, for with the heart, so we're going to deal with the second statement first. The verse 9 tells us that two things need to happen. A confession with the mouth and a believing with the heart, right? The believing takes place in the heart, that's an important thing to grasp because so many of us are so used to thinking, uh, you know, all the time thinking that we, we don't even have an awareness of, of having a core of our being, and yet the, the, the believing doesn't take place in your head. It takes place in your heart. And by heart, we're not describing the blood pump that sits underneath your ribs. We're talking about the core of your being, the center of who you are. And uh, it doesn't always happen this way for folks, but, you know, oftentimes you can almost kind of feel your thoughts inside your head. You're looking at me kind of peculiarly. Does anybody besides me ever? It doesn't always seem that way, but once in a while you can almost feel them moving around in there. Not that they are, but it seems that way. Well, the core of our being, very often it sort of feels or seems like it's, it's right here somewhere. And it's just, it's a different thing than the way I think. And it's not a feeling, it's a sense, an awareness, if you will, of something happening at the very center of who I am. He says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Believing brings in the right standing, the authorization we were talking about, the opportunity to do something. If we don't believe, we don't have the authority. But being given the authority, being given the authorization, we now need to do something with it. And confession is made unto salvation. The deliverance and the wholeness comes from what's said, but the authority to say it comes from what we believe. 
And if you don't have authority to say it, it doesn't matter what you say. <laughs> right? And if you've got the authority but you don't say it, it doesn't matter what you say. Now let's walk through that for a moment in a, in a simple example. You or I could leap out into traffic and hold up our hand and hope that something good happens, but there's no real reason for you to expect that something good is going to happen if you do that because you don't really have the authority to tell everybody what they're going to do. And you could jump into the middle of the intersection down here after service and start telling people, come on, come on, yes, you go left, go left. But they, they may or may not pay any attention to you because you don't have the authority to do that. Now, if you had the uniform, if we see the little white police car sitting by the side of the road there and spot that you're standing in the middle of the intersection wearing the uniform, complete with the brass buttons and the white gloves, and you're saying, you, go, you, go, well, we get it. We better go. Because that's the authority standing right there, isn't it? Now, if, the, if that authority is sitting in the car, looking at the traffic in the intersection, thinking, you ought to go, ma'am. Yes, you, ma'am, you ought to be going. Well, we're not doing anything. Why? Because the authority isn't taking action. The authority is sitting in the car, throwing thoughts in the direction of people who aren't paying any attention. We need the two things to be together. You have to be authorized to do this, and then you have to take action with that authority. And that's all that verse 10 is telling us. The heart is where believing takes place, and believing realizes the authorization. The mouth is where confession takes place, and confession is the acting on the authorization. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So now we get further explanation or amplification of that explanation. At verse 11 he says, the scripture, we have God's word promising us that when we believe, we won't be turned away. We won't be cast out. We won't be found hopeless because we do have an authorization. We have been given the authority to do something simply because we believe. We have His promise on that. That isn't my doctrine. It isn't your doctrine. It's God's promise to us. Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. But then he goes on to say at verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Now this is an interesting statement. We're going to recognize that the Jew is describing the religious person, the person who has studied the Scriptures and knows a great deal of what God has said and is endeavoring to do the right things. The Greek in this context is referring to somebody who is a, a, a completely apart from God and knows nothing of these things. And what he's saying in essence is whether your culture is that of religion and the scriptures or whether your culture is that of the world and no scriptures, in either case, God's mercy is towards you. God's passion is with you. You qualify. He's the same Lord over all of you and he's rich towards everybody who calls on him. He doesn't have one line for religious people and one line for pagans. We're all in the same line, and when we call on Him, we have equal access. And then it says at verse 13, For whosoever shall call. Now verse 11 was an amplification of, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Verse 13 is an amplification of, And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's another statement from Scripture. The point is we have His promise on this again, that in the calling we receive a deliverance, we receive a salvation, we receive a wholeness. This is not based on you thinking that sounds good or me thinking that sounds good or either one of us having an intuition that that seems right. It's based on His promise to us. It's based on His Word and His declaration to us. This is describing the mechanism by which the Spirit of Christmas operates. Now these next several verses go on to amplify our confidence in His Word and our reason for caring about it. He says, how then shall they call on him of whom they've not believed? Which is a good question. How are we going to call on the name of somebody we don't believe in? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? We're not going to believe in him if we haven't heard of him, right? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? Which is to say, it isn't just enough to broadcast the name of Jesus, but there needs to be folks who have been called and sent to proclaim. Now, we're not talking about pulpit ministries. We're not talking about people who have been ordained for the purpose. We're talking about individuals like me, like you, who have been called and sent to proclaim, sent into CVS, sent into Walgreens, sent into Stop and Shop, sent into the places we work, sent into the places we visit, sent into the places we shop, sent into the places where our children go to school, sent into the places where we conduct our lives, sent out into the recreation fields and into the malls to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. But they won't hear unless somebody does this proclaiming, right? And he says, how shall they preach except they be sent? There has to be a sending. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The believing that we started out talking about, which is the first step in this whole process, comes from hearing and hearing from God's Word. And specifically, he hasn't said the Logos of God, the, the Word of God in the normal sense, but he said the Rhema, the spoken Word. God-breathed words are where faith comes from. God-breathed words are where faith comes from. Our believing is connected to hearing God speaking. And when we do, our response is very simply to believe. Now, if you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter 4, we're almost done here this morning, but we're never done celebrating that Jesus Christ has come. In the fourth chapter of Galatians, it summarizes the story this way. It says, beginning at verse 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now there's a couple of things in verse 5 I want to spend a moment visiting with. First of all, he says to redeem them. Some translations like the word ransom, to ransom them. The word is talking about buying out from under something. Buying out from under something. Every one of us was under something, and we had no way to pay to get ourselves free. There's no way we could have saved up to get ourselves free. We were inadequate to the price. And yet God has come in Jesus Christ and paid the price to bring that freedom, to ransom and redeem us. Is that exciting? I find that kind of exciting. That we're under the law. That we might receive the adoption of sons. And the scripture speaks about two very different things, uh, but using a similar language. It talks about us being the children of God, born of His Spirit, and it talks about us being adopted. And we sometimes, because we attach our modern notions of adoption and whatnot to that, struggle with understanding that. But we need to put it in the context of the society in which we were dealing. And adoption was a common practice in, in Roman times, even among adults. And if you think about it, you've probably run across that somewhere in, in literature or uh, somewhere like that. I guess there's uh, several stories that I could probably refer to where adults are adopted by uh, citizens of some standing in, in a Roman setting, right? There's a few well-known works of fiction with that as being one of their central plot pieces, right? There's somebody's circumstances turn dramatically as they're adopted by someone with power, frequently in response for some heroic deed on their part, right? Boom. Boom. Well, there's no heroic deed on your part, but that's the adoption we're referring to. The one that makes you, you see, when you're born into the house of God, you're a baby, spiritually speaking. But when you're adopted, you have the full rights and privileges of any other member of the household. You have full standing as a son and an heir and everything that that means. And that's the adoption they're referring to. Not the, the adoption like at the dog pound, but the adoption where you are placed in full standing as a complete adult heir. And so our legal position 
spiritually speaking, is as adult children of God. Now, it may be that, in fact, we're spiritual babies with an awful lot of growing to do. But our legal position is adult children. That is the adoption we're referring to. And so he says that God paid this price, brought forth Jesus Christ so that he could ransom us from under the, what, the weight we were under and give us the legal position as his children, adult children with all of the rights and privileges that come with that. And then he goes on to say at verse 6, And because you are those sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That is the Spirit of Christmas, right there. God's Spirit sent forth into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, Father is a translation of the Greek word for Father. Yes, there was no trick on that one. It's, it's, it's patron. It's father. Abba, however, is not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic word. And so there, the, what we have here is words in two different languages, both of which mean father or dad. And specifically, by throwing in the Aramaic word, we get the picture. This is the word that a child uses in Aramaic to describe their father. Now, there are people who call their father, Father. My mother is one of them. She always called her father, Father. That was her name for him. But there aren't a lot of people. Most of us have something else that we call him. Dad or Pops or something. And that's what this word is. It's that, that ordinary, run-of-the-mill, everyday word that little children use for Daddy. Set beside the Greek term, for daddy. And the point is here that the Spirit doesn't come into our hearts to make us stiff and religious and say, Father. But He comes into our hearts crying, Daddy, and saying we're His. And that this is our Father who loves us, who cares for us, to whom it matters concerning us, who so loves us that He gave His only begotten Son that as we believe on Him, we should be delivered from perishing and have everlasting life. That is the story. That is the purpose. That is what we celebrate together. Amen? Let's stand up together, if you will. I'll remind you again that in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, the 9th verse says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I'm going to invite you in a moment to make a confession of faith with me as we pray together. Whether it's your first time or your thousandth time, it's pleasing to God to hear us confess our faith in Jesus Christ. I say that with some authority. It's pleasing to God to hear us confess our faith in Jesus Christ. You might be wondering what it is that you believe. We read earlier, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And we've looked at a good deal of the Word of God here together this morning. And God has been working by His Spirit, speaking to each of us from these words that we've been reading. And we've been offered the opportunity to believe, to accept and receive that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the power of God's faithful judgment and righteousness. And that because of that, we can be born of that same Spirit. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead can come to dwell in our mortal bodies. So I'm going to invite you to take action on this opportunity and join me in making this confession. Dear God, I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for hearing my cry this morning. I do confess with my mouth that I believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ is my Lord. I thank you, Father, for this new life for your spirit dwelling in me, for your spirit dwelling in me, and for your light 
leading me forward. And for your light leading me forward. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let me take a moment and pray with you.